Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our session, Exploring Valuing People, one of the eight core behaviors under the new profession map. I hope you can all hear me well, and you've just heard that video that was playing in the background. I can still see people are trying to join us. So while they're joining in, I would like you to use the chat box to do a short introduction about who you are and what you do, and what are you looking for to get from this session today. We are recording this session, so please uh, don't use any uh, descriptions that will describe the organization that you're working for in any of the chat or the group. You are muted upon entry as part of our webinar. We do have a bit of interaction later on and a bit of group debate in, in uh, breakout rooms for us to go through some of the case studies that we'll be exploring later on. Now, for those of you that haven't met me before, my name is Cipriana Alhire, or Chip, like potato chip, short and, and simple for everybody to pronounce. I am currently an associate for the CAPD and I work for the CAPD. My background is a mix of generalist HR management, implementing talent management, learning and development, and leadership development across uh, non-for-profit, as well as small and medium organizations. And currently at CAPD, I have this dual role of leading on CAPD London and everything that we do as a proposition for our 25,000 members in the capital and working with the seven branches that we do here. And the other side of, of my role at CAPD is I lead on a portfolio of strategic projects and programs some to do with digital transformation, a lot of them doing with uh, volunteer experience and, and journey, as well as the member to member mentoring program that we have across the country. My gay job is uh, I founded the CAPD's uh, LGBT network, and currently I am a member of our DNI steering group looking at the CAPD's proposition internally and externally on diversity and inclusion. So you would expect that we're having a lot of conversations these days, specifically around the anti-racism movement. With me, I have my colleague, Yutunde Oladipo, and I'm just gonna allow Yutunde to introduce herself. Yutunde, over to you. Right, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to this edition of the HR Professional Map. My name is Jitun Deyo Ladipo. Some of you may know me already. I currently work as a senior talent consultant for a large government department where I look after a large portfolio of our talent development programs for senior leaders and future leaders. I've got experience of working in recruitment and pay for um, for, for IT and digital roles within the organization, also looking after uh, diversity and inclusion before, as well as HR business partnering. I'm currently joint chairperson for CIPD North London branch, where I work with a fantastic committee. There are 14 of us on the committee, and my joint chairperson is um, talking of flexible working and valuing people. Um, we have a cross Atlantic job sharing. Um, at the moment, which is um, great um, because we play to each other's strengths. I also um, speak at CIPD conferences. I was at the, I was on the panel discussion for talent management uh, last week and yesterday um, speaking at the CIPD London Fellows event on organizations' responses to COVID and racism. So Chipian and I will be looking at, um, will be covering this model today. Okay, so let's start off with an overview of the core behavior content. Um, we, we've just watched a video now that introduces the HR professional map to us. Today we're going to look at one of the um, eight core behaviors that you can see on the screen. So this, this, um, the core behavior actually has um, eight behaviors within them of which valuing people is one of them. Now let's just do a quick check using the chat box. Um, how familiar are you with the 
professional map. Just a quick check. Chippian, can you keep an eye on the charts for us, please? Okay, no knowledge. Okay, thank you. Right, too familiar, right? Okay. Need more? Okay, thanks, Alicia. Right, Veronica, very familiar, great. That's great. Okay, so we need more knowledge. So I, th I think that's 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 really good to understand where, um, how much we all know about it. So hopefully today we would cover a lot of a lot of that for you to make sure that everybody has a better understanding of it, and then we can then use it, um, being the the international benchmark for the people profession. So it, hopefully today we will be able to to understand it better. And then you can use it for yourself and your organizations in how you make decisions, um, how you, to act with confidence for you to perform at your peak and drive change within your organization as well as develop your own career. So, um, and I think there's a lot of changes going on where organizations are looking uh, at it, um, the people profession to be able to provide some solutions or, or shape the direction that organizations are going. So I think doing this now is very timely for us as, as a profession. Again, using the chat box, let's look at um, the other seven core behaviors. Looking at this, uh, at, at the world that we, we have now, which of the seven behaviors do you think best links to valuing people? Again, use the chat. Which one do you think best links with, okay, working inclusively, ethical practice, that's great. Okay, ethical practice again. Ethical practice, that's great. Thanks, Jacob. Working inclusively. Veronica says all of them. So I think ethical practice and working inclusively uh, uh, is what a lot of you are saying, which is good. Professional courage and influence. That's interesting. So keep it coming. All of it, okay? All play factor, absolutely. Okay. That's fantastic. Thank you. So I think for, from, from what we're saying in the chat, ooh, an interesting one, situational decision making, working inclusively, professional courage. That's really good. Thank you. And I think all of them do play um, an important role and they all link. So you can see that none of them exist in isolation. They all work together for all the people, um, you know, for all of us. And it's something that we can use regardless of your professional specialism, whether you work in um, generalist HR or OD or L&D or pay, regardless of your specialism, you will find that the, the, the core behaviors and valuing people actually play a key role. They're important for all of us. And you find them again in the CIPD statement of importance. And this is for everyone within the profession to be able to champion better work and working lives. Okay. So, so we look at valuing people because that's the area that we're focusing on today um, out of the eight behaviors. But first, when we say valuing people, what do we understand by that term? Again, you can respond in the chat. What does valuing people mean to you? Let's have some views in the chat. Valuing people. Making everyone's opinion count. That's what Wesley says. Okay. Knowing your people. Thanks, Jidlin. Right. Everyone being heard. Providing people with good quality. Respecting one another. Making people feel important. Thanks, Nicholas. Anna says, treating them fairly and helping them to develop better. And Catherine says, says, working with staff holistically to obtain the best results. And that is really fantastic because um, as people professional, we all need to have a core purpose that everybody's working towards. And it fits in nicely with everything that you've said, you know, that's what valuing people is um, really. So as people professionals, 
we have a key role to play within our organization to build a sense of shared values, just like we have been saying in the chat just now, and also to drive, to, to be able to give me people a meaningful voice in matters that affect their working lives. You know, we're seeing a lot of that coming up. And Diona is saying, you know, allowing people to meet their potential in the workplace. And that is really fantastic. That's what valuing people is, appreciating what people bring, what everybody brings to the table. So that's fantastic. So in working alongside managers and leaders, people professionals will work to encourage a culture of trust, of, of trust. And you can see, you know, there's, we need a lot of that right now with every, all the crisis that we're dealing with. So we need to be able to encourage a, a culture of trust where, and also of people development for everybody and well-being so that people can be their best at work. So I think now more than any time else, in, in you know in the recent years, trust and well-being are very very important. So we do have a key role to play in that, not just for us as HR professionals, but also alongside um, for the other business leaders, so that everybody uh, plays a role and takes some responsibilities in that. Okay. And Julian is saying encouraging everyone to bring their whole self to work. Fantastic. So when we look at the four aspects of valuing people here, these are the, the, the things that actually bring that, um, that um, value, valuing people. These are the four things that actually bring it alive. In, in my view, you know, it's about communicating with meaning and purpose um, to motivate and inspire others, just as we have been saying um, earlier on in the chat just now. So it's about building a the sense of team spirit and communicating the purpose of work in order to motivate and inspire everybody at work. I think it's also about um, treating people fairly and demonstrating humanity and compassion in your work. Doing that, I think in, in, doing that would actually help to increase and promote well-being of uh, everybody in the organization. So it's about being uh, demonstrating that compassion. There is also the fact that one of the lessons from this is that it enables other people to develop and support their team's development. So everybody has something to bring to the table. So how do we then encourage each other to be able to do that and develop and bring, you know, and you know, work towards that core purpose? So that's one of the lessons we learn, we learn from this behavior. And fourthly, it's about enabling people to have a meaningful voice it, by involving them in decisions that impact their lives and also bringing a people-centric perspective to organizational decision making. Again, you know, I think the, the, the issues that we're dealing with now are just, you know, a good opportunity, even though, you know, it's, it's a crisis, but it's an opportunity for us to actually bring this value to life in, in what we do. So, so again, for references, I'll just mention here a list of the key lessons that we can learn from this. I think for me, there are five. So which is about getting started with valuing people, establishing a sense of purpose, treating people fairly, regardless of you know, whatever differences they have, and enabling everybody to develop, as well as involving people in decisions that we make that affect them. Okay. Now, let's start thinking about valuing people. And indeed, looking at it from the, you know, from the point of view of all the other core, core values, really. Um, Chipan, are we going to watch the video or have, have we done a video? Okay. Sorry, you're on mute, I can't hear you. Yes, so um, I will also be adding the link into the chat in case you um, have some technical um, so the internet connection is, is not very stable. We will be playing as part of this as well, and there are specific things that um, you need to pay attention in, in the video, so you can catch just some of the ideas that came across. Okay. Remember, be, before we watch the video, I just want us to remember those four things we talked about before, you know, the four aspects of valuing people, about communication, demonstrating compassion, enabling managers to support others, and also enabling everybody to, to bring their whole self to work. So think of all those four areas while we are looking at this, while we're watching this video, and then we can 
try come back then and find out you know what does this mean for you for you as a people professional so now let's watch the video and make a note of those four things when you see them thanks Chapin. are you able to see my video screen now no you still seeing the slide we're still seeing the slide Now? You saw that I... Meet Dimitri. He's an L&D specialist working for a not-for-profit organisation that provides telephone counselling for people who are experiencing domestic violence. He's been tasked with redesigning the organization's basic training program for new counsellors. The existing two-week face-to-face program has been effective, but is proving increasingly onerous and inflexible for new starters, who typically now work from their home base. Many find it hard to spend so long away from home, which is hindering recruitment. Additionally, those trainees with lots of counselling experience are finding the program is too long while others have barely achieved the desired level of confidence by the time the programme's completed. Time for a change. Dimitri assembles a team, including a representative from HR, the existing instructors, managers from the counselling team, and an expert in learning technologies, as well as a few of the counsellors who've recently attended the existing programme. Dimitri leads them through an exercise to establish their goals for the project. They agree that their primary purpose is to reduce the time to competence while maintaining quality standards and providing a more flexible, satisfying learning experience for trainees. Valuing people means understanding the purpose of your work. This team now has a clear, unifying purpose which will sustain it throughout the project. The team spends some time agreeing who their key stakeholders might be and what hopes and fears these people will have about the changes. They're particularly concerned that new counsellors joining the organisation are able to achieve the required level of competence without the disruption of having to be away from home for a sustained period. Many find this extremely difficult because they have lots of commitments, including care responsibilities. On the other hand, they don't want the programme to be an entirely remote, isolated experience. The work is stressful and many counsellors benefit from the support of contacts they make during their initial training. The team also openly discusses the anxieties that might be present within the team itself. It soon becomes clear that the existing instructors feel threatened by the prospect of the programme becoming predominantly online. Valuing people means empathising with others and considering their well-being. The team has deliberately adopted the perspective of all key stakeholders so they can do their best to consider the interests of everyone involved. They decide that they don't have enough information to design a learning experience that will be sufficiently engaging, relevant and accessible for all new trainees. So they decide to put together a focus group made up of a wider population of counsellors who've recently been through the programme. They work with this group to pinpoint the challenges that counsellors face when they first join the organisation and to identify the factors that would contribute to an improved learning experience. Valuing people means asking those involved for their opinion and listening carefully to responses. This team is working hard to make sure they understand the needs of their learners. The focus group will provide them with insights they'd probably never achieve if their only input was from management. The team progresses well with their analysis and comes up with a draft design for a programme that combines self-study, one-to-one -one and group activities, and some face-to-face -face sessions. The new programme will be tailored so that every trainee gets exactly what they need to reach the required level of competence in the quickest time possible. Moving appropriate content online will mean that the existing instructors will need to take on new roles and acquire some new skills. The learning technology expert agrees to help the instructors to find the support they need to excel in this new environment. 
Valuing people means supporting others to develop and be their best. For most people, it is highly motivating to develop mastery in the skills required for their job. It would be easy to dismiss the instructors as old school and look for new people to take their place, but this would be losing lifetimes of experience and commitment to the organisation. Better to move forward as a team, and that's what valuing people is all about. Right, thanks, Tiffin. I liked how that video ended. Better to move forward as a team. I think that just summarizes what valuing people is in many organizations. Um, well, I hope in many organizations, but we'll find out now. Now, watching that video, again, using the chat, were you able to identify the four areas of um, valuing people we talked about before watching the video? Were you able to identify that in, in what you've just seen? You can use the chat, yes or no, and once you might have identified, okay. Rana says yes, most of you are saying yes. Sarah says yes, who has Veronica. Okay, Nicholas, well, great. Okay, which are the ones that you identified? And you can put that in the chat. A lot of you are saying yes. So tell us a little bit more before we move on. All of them, and what are they? Okay, treating people fairly, absolutely, yeah. Kerry says, emp empathizing and considering well-being, absolutely, and that's part of demonstrating passion. And Alicia says, treating people fairly, again, part of demonstrating passion there. And Savannah says, enabling people to have a meaningful voice, absolutely. So, allowing different, allowing, okay, I think, allowing different opinions, great. Okay, fairness and approach. Okay, valuing others and moving forward, treating them as a tree, as a team, treat people fairly, motivate and encourage them. All, all of those things you've said are fantastic. And those are the, 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 the key lessons and the four areas of, of, um, of this core behavior. So when, let's have another look at, at this again. From the webinar just saying, Again, you don't have to expose yourselves, but you, you may just want to, um, without expressing yourself or, or, the, or, your, or the organization that, that you work for, do you think that there is work to be done in your organization? And what does this mean for your organization? Do you think that there is work to be done on what valuing people means within the organization that you work for? So we're seeing some chats coming through. Okay, Liz says yes, absolutely. So that's Kerry, involving and bringing them together, right? Okay. okay. Yes, upper management needs to bridge the gap, listening to all voices. There's always room for improvement. Okay, Nicola saying yes, meaningful voice. So has Lily. Definitely lots to do. And Ahmed agrees to that, and Jackie too. Oh yes, not guessing what people want, but giving them the chance to contribute. Again, that's about again giving everybody an opportunity to to have their say, to have their voice, like we saw in that in the focus groups that was established in there. Yes. Okay, many organisations are interested in sales and profit, not their team members' development. So all of this show that you know there is still a lot of work to do, um, that we need to um, support our organisations in doing that. Again, HR uh, as people professionals, we should be we should be actually championing this within our organisations, not separating it from, from the, the core business, as we have seen in, in this video. It's part of the overall business. It's part of communicating that wider purpose so that everybody has an opportunity to play their own role within that. That's great. So, um, again, thinking of that video, Dimitri had some, um, he gathered people together to form a, fo a focus group and a project group to design a new basic training program. Now, what do you think, what do you remember as his three key goals? What were the three key goals? Again, using the chat, you can put that in there. What were his three goals? It's 
spot on, Kerry. Time, quality, flexibility. And Teresa also adds about um, quality as well. So what, what do all those three things mean? So it's about the time, the pace that we, at which they need to get um, the work done. And the quality, the quality again is about the standards of what they expect, what they would like to see, and the flexibility um, around having satisfy, uh, satisfactory learning experience. And as Sarah also says, yes, yeah, appreciating that not one size fits all. And that's why putting together a focus group to look, to look into that really helps um, help them to get the results that they needed in, in that case study. So that's great. Thank you very much for all of that. So we'll now see that, yes, you, not, you can now see the slides. The basic training program needed to address three things. It had three goals, time, quality, flexibility. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Chipan, do I hand over to you at this point? Please. Mm -hmm. This one as well, and I'll take people through the case studies. Brilliant, thank you. Pardon? You want me to continue? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we've talked about one of the key, the key um, purposes of valuing people and in the case study that we saw now it's about establishing a sense of purpose a sense of purpose that everybody can follow and understand and it's very clear so the what we're going to look at now we'll look at some case um two scenarios yeah. uh, and if we have time we'll, ha we'll have a look at if not we, we can do one at least we'll do one to start with so we'll look at that to, um to look at about um, the, uh, take a lesson from understanding and establishing a sense of purpose. So we'll be looking at different factors behind motivation, the role that motivation plays in, ter in, in terms of um, in terms of creating a sense of purpose here. So we look at some uh, scenarios. Uh, there are two scenarios. There's one for HR and one for L and D. But maybe yeah. before we continue, should we do a quick poll just to see um, the the special we have in the room? I'll just so as the statement that you see here is basically one of the main reasons why valuing people has been elevated as being one of the eight core behaviors. So if you think of all the behaviors that an HR professional could have, this is one of the key reasons why valuing people specifically has been elevated part of the eight core ones. So as people professionals, it's critical that we value people and we put them at the center of the approach. If you think back to that balance that we're trying to create as people professionals, almost like looking at the needs of our people, the needs of our business, and the needs of, of the environment that the organization operates in to make sure we keep our organizations being quite people-centric. So we're balancing consideration, compassion and fairness, and supporting others. And I've posed a, a question in, in the chat of, of what does this statement mean to you or your practice? Uh, which I think it's, it's something that we can reflect on and, and honestly, I don't want you just to write in the chat box at the moment. I want you to think of maybe put it on, on your notepad, you have one nearby. After this session is, is done, I want you to spend five to 10 minutes by yourself reflecting of what this value means to you as an individual, as a people professional, and then how you can actually activate that specific value into the work that you're doing, whether you're in employment, whether you're a consultant, whether you're currently looking for a job or you're a student, in all of that context, different contexts that you might be finding yourself, how do you activate this value and, and what that is, does it mean to you? And then what we will do is, I think we have enough time to, to do both case studies. So we have one designed for HR and one for learning and development. And as part of the, the case study, we won't look holistically at valuing people, but we only take this um, particular area of establishing a sense of purpose. Um, 
And earlier when, when you saw the case study with Dimitri, he was talking about this blend approach. So you have an online version, which is basically what we're doing now. It was that personal reflection and personal learning, which I just gave you a task to do that you'll be reflecting after the webinar. Um, and you also might have seen in there as one of those different triangles on how they design the solution is that they use that collaboration and that element of joint teams learning together, which is what we'll, we will be doing as, as part of this session, because I think you as HR professionals can add a lot of value to this part of conversation. So I will be splitting you into breakout rooms, but not before I give you a bit of a sense of the HR scenario. Then we'll come back and we'll, we'll do a bit of debrief on the conversations we've had on the HR scenario. I'll show you the L&D scenario as well. We'll talk about that and, and the results of it. And then I'll give you some uh, reflection points and, and some takeaways for you to, to take as practical activity after this uh, workshop. Perfect, so now this is the HR scenario. So you've been approached uh, to do some HR consultancy, exploring employee engagement for an organization that creates software, which has raised privacy concerns among human rights groups. They believe it might be sharing data with organizations without the consult of consent of users. By all accounts, the organization is a good employer and provides excellent salary and benefits. What do you do? So think in the context of GDPR or data protection, because GDPR now with us not being part of European Union has completely different context. Think about data protection, think about as an HR professional, what is your role in uh, or HR consultant, what is your role in um, playing in this scenario? I've put the scenario also into the chat box. So when you are in the breakout rooms, you will be able to click on the chat box and see the scenario there. And I will give you 15 minutes for the first uh, breakout room for us to have conversations around the scenario. I'll make it around eight to nine people per each group. So you can use the 15 minutes just to do quick, brief introductions for everybody. And while you're doing the introduction, you can say, what would you do as an HR professional specifically for, for this scenario? So after the 15 minutes, you'll be pulled back in here. Now, the rules of the breakout room is that nothing that's happening in there is recorded. So please be kind to one another. Also, feel free to unmute yourself and turn on your camera so you can have a, a more of an immersive conversation rather than what, what we went through, the content that we went through so far. And I will just be moving between the rooms to make sure that uh, you don't need any technical support. And if you do, there's a specific button in there that says ask for help that just pulls me from whatever I am into your room to, to provide you with support. So I shall see you in about 15 minutes and you'll have a specific timer that will tell you how much time you, you have left in there as well. See you back here in 15 minutes. Perfect, welcome back. There's still a few people that are reconnecting. Perfect, so how was that? Thumbs up, thumbs down? 
It's a good conversation. Give some thumbs up. Now, who would want to share some of your conversations in the room? They can use that chat functionality, or if you want to share verbally, you can just raise your hand under the participants list and I'll just unmute you. Just be mindful that we are recording, so don't disclose anything about organizations. Susan, yes. Susan, can you unmute yourself? Uh, yes. Um, um, I felt that it was quite difficult to answer the question without some more background information and some more context. So the first thing um, was by whom have I been approached? Is it one of the human rights groups or is it the chief executive of the organization? Because you would have a very different um, set of advice to give depending on who, who was asking the question. Um, the other, um, you know, that there's a belief that there's sharing data, but you would need to have some proof before uh, understanding that. Um, there is a, a, a bit of a challenge of a balance because if data is being shared and if it's personal data, then actually what you should do is report this to the ICO. But if this is your employer, mm, that might be a difficult thing to do. So I think, you know, there are, it's obviously deliberately worded to generate lots of discussion, which yeah. we did have. <laughs> I think yeah. my the last thing I'd like to say is um, the organization is a good employer and provides excellent salary and benefits. I would say there's many more things apart from salary and benefits that make a good employer. Yeah, and I think that the way that it's coming across, would you have been approached to do some HR consultancy on employee engagement is it's just not clear enough, but sometimes as an HR consultant, that is how much you're getting, that, that level of information. And I liked how you started your answer with depends. I think that's, that's maybe the most used sentence in HR these days, with depends on the circumstances and who's asking and, and what we're dealing with. Thank you very much for sharing, Susan. Mark, do you want to share? Uh, yeah, yes, can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, f first off, um, f thanks, Susan. Um, I, I absolutely agree that, um, as, you, as you say, not, not enough information really to go on. Um, you also highlighted the, the point that, uh, you know, this is, this is about the belief rather than, you know, we, we abs you know, there's, there's, um, clear definitive proof or evidence of something. Um, one thing, and, and I, I, I'll say this, um, that immediately jumped out at me on, on this. Now, it only says you've been approached to do this consultancy. So, you, you, you know, you can quite happily <laughs> say, actually, no, thank you, step back, walk away. Um, I mean, just just you know in in terms of yes how how to approach this uh i mean one of one of one of the key things um yes be, before you you can decide whether or not you are actually going to take this this assignment on uh the the, the there is an element of, of due diligence to be done um yes is is this um what's believed to be happening um or you know is there a legitimate claim um other issues, um, you know, what data are we talking about here? Whose is it? Um, to what extent has, has consent been given and what, what is that consent? Um, e equally, you know, is, is, that, is that consent in line with the legal situation and, and so on? And, 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 and as was pointed out, uh, you know that that's far more an issue for for the ICO than than you know you as as an HR practitioner. Um, so often coming in to look specifically at the engagement. Mm, you yeah, shared, I mean, uh, yeah. shared in in the chat as well. Mm, um, and I mean at another another point on the on the issue that you know it's believed or it is claimed that this is happening. Um, you know, if, if the organization is actually 
compliant and you know what how they treat data could be considered as you know good practice at the very least um you know do do they actually need something in relation to public relations or communications to share that rather than you know um an hr or employee engagement intervention um if if that is the case um you know it, it are you know whether or not their their policies etc are adequate or compliant yeah um, but look yeah. at it from the perspective of valuing people so what is no, uh, valuing people okay okay sorry um well uh from valuing people then um one thing that uh we we did discuss slightly yeah from the, the valuing people side of it uh um, there's surely an element here of the ethics and professional code. Um, I've been reading my slides in advance. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 I'll just, you know, I'll just show you some, some of the things where... This, this stuff's just out there about. in the ether. You, 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 you've just got to find it and, and pull it out there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think that was... Just, just about what we we uh, we'd covered. But, um, yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mark, for sharing. No worries. So this is our recommended uh, response. So there are very different perspectives and what is ethical and what is not. And it is important to understand the full situation before we make our own judgment whether it's okay to make money from this employment. I think this has been covered in a lot of the conversation in a lot of the comments that came through through the chat as well. The conversations that I've been part of, it's moving between the groups as well as what, what was just said now. And then depending on the nature of the role that you're being asked to fulfill, which we don't have full clarity on, it could be an opportunity for you to demonstrate valuing people, both in the organization as well as extended that to the customers and users outside of the organization too, to some of those things that we were talking about. So it might be our responsibility to report this if it's protecting our people. And if we look at our customers being part of valuing people as well. Perfect. Christine, do you have something to add? I can hear you. I was interested in Mark's point where he said, you might decide to walk away from it. <laughs> um, but I think it's important if as an HR professional, you're in a scenario like this, it's important. I mean, my first question would also be from asking the company what it is they want to achieve out of this piece of work. So if, if I were to go in, do they want me to um, quieten all of the concerns and paper over the cracks? Or are they going going to listen to some truths about how they should be valuing people um, because as professionals it's also about supporting others to value people as well and if the managers in that organization have got a rather skewed sense of how they value people that it has actually raised concerns amongst the workforce and has affected employee engagement then actually I would be quite happy myself to have those conversations with them about better ways to value people. And I think that's an important thing that HR can bring, not just as external consultants, but yeah. also internally, even if you're working in the organization. So that's yeah. a tough balance, and, but it links back to our ethics, um, as Mark said. I feel like going back to what we were saying earlier, which depends on so many factors and yeah. how we do all of these. Thank you very much, Christine, for sharing. I Perfect. think so, this is really interesting, Pippin. I'm just listening to the conversations we're having now, and a few people have said some things that I, I think we also need to be, be conscious of as CIPD members. It's about walk away from it, you know, having that courage to walk away from it if you feel that it's unethical and what they're asking you to do is unethical because as a professional body we have a code of conduct that you know we are bound by 
And if we do anything in breach of that and it's found out, you know, there will be consequences for that for us as professionals. So I think that's something that maybe there's an option there to, to think about more widely. We don't have the time for it today, but it just to be clear that sometimes you need to walk away from it if you feel that it's on, you know, what you're being asked to do. So say I member as some professional and unethical so that you don't um, do things um, that would um, move you away from the code of conduct that you have signed up yeah. And there are questions of, can you actually go in and change some of these things and, and turn the organization for the better? Or would you rather be using your energy and effort somewhere else as well? So it's, it's that debate of not breaching your ethics or the code of conduct and making sure you're keeping everyone safe can actually change the organization to starting to think better about their people and the ethics and everything else that they, they do. Thank you very much, you two. So, we go into the next case study. So, this is the L&D scenario. So, you're an L&D manager for a retail organization and your team is dispersed across several different offices in the country. You have noticed that among your direct reports, you have one person that appears not to be a team player. And at the team meeting, where everyone comes together in the same location for a day, this perception is reinforced. This person does not cooperate with other members of the team and keeps themselves to themselves. You know, however, that they have specialist technical skills, which no one else has in, in your, the rest of your team, and from which everyone could benefit from being shared. Now, from the perspective of uh, valuing people, what would you do as an l and practitioner? I'm just going to mix up the rooms. And I'm going to copy paste the case study in the chat first, so you can access, have access to it when you go in the room. And then We'll do the same thing. So you'll be with new people in the room, take the first few seconds to introduce yourself and, and get to know the rest of uh, people in there, talk about the case studies, what would you do? And then before 15 minutes are over, think about delegating the responsibility to someone that will come and share in the main room, where rather either in chat or functionality in, in typing some of the answers or verbally if they feel comfortable doing that. So see you in 15 minutes.
just time back to the coding and we were here. Perfect. What were some of your reflections going through this exercise? Am I, is, is, is it me? Yeah. Okay. Um, and just, just to say it was, yeah, it was sort of um, universal agreement that I was, I was getting this one. Um, I know, I know you said that uh, the answer wasn't, it depends. Um, having said that, um, in terms of, so to, to say definitively what the solution is here, um, there isn't really sufficient information, um, which of course is deliberate. I understand that. Um, well, when in any case in mm. a LND and OD, you get sufficient information to make super informed decisions. Every single time you have to go in and scout for it. That's a fair point. Yeah, it would be a first. Um, one of, uh, I mean, one, one thing that uh, we, we did discuss um, I, I suppose to start off with, um, so this, this person is described as not a team player, not cooperative. Um, how important an issue is that? Um, is it, um, does it actually create problems for the their work the wider team those sorts of things or is the you know um how how, how significant an issue is this um you know define cooperation as well um so what is your recommended answer is it ah, well uh, uh, uh so some of the issues to consider at least um i mean one one thing um so you know I mean, I, I, I use the phrase myself, you know, is this the tyranny of the group? Um, is everyone else, you know, quite a high extrovert, but this person is, you know, far more introverted, therefore they stand out as different. Um, you know, is, 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 are people uncomfortable with that? Do they, do they dislike it? Um, I mean, you, 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 you could all, you know, the, 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 there's also potentially a flip side to this that says um, the, the fact of the, the specialist technical skills are, you know, is, is the, uh, the, the lack of cooperation, the lack of engagement with the rest of the team, um, is, is that, you know, is, is that um, a demonstration of a form of uh, perceived superiority or arrogance? Oh, you're these, coming up with, with even more theories. These, well, the, these people know less than me, therefore, why should I communicate or engage with them? So what uh, is your recommendation? Um, what is my recommendation? Um, one of the... Um, one thing that... Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know whether it's been written this way deliberately, um, but I did actually wonder whether um, there was an effort to deliberately um, describe or, or, or suggest someone on the autistic spectrum. Um, in which case, you will there there will be an element of difference between that person and you know a neurotypical group. Um, you know, if, if it's that, if that's, if that's the situation, then how you address that will be very different to um, if it's a question of uh, um, you know, I I I indifference, hostility, whatever it is, or, or attitude within the team. Yeah. It wasn't specifically designed like that. And basically, we said that it might be some sort of diverse, diversity in the personality or mm -hmm. in, in the individual that is likely to be a good thing for the team. So if, if you look at that as, as a whole concept, and then the fact that the person keeps to themselves is not in itself a problem, 
unless it's counterproductive to what you're trying mm -hmm. to deliver. And their interaction with others is actually harming performance and the team. So not going for social drinks with your colleagues should never be in someone's ability to deliver the job. Ab absolutely, yeah, yeah. No, there's no, no, no argument here, Chibrian. Yeah. So to tackle the situation, you need to make a clear distinction between that behavior that is simply different than the rest yes. for the rest of the organization uh, and the behavior that is unhelpful. So you start the conversation with the individual, which I've sort of hinted in, in one of the groups as well. So what would you do? Start the conversation with the individual, understand um, some, some of the circumstances that they're going through, mm, mm, mm. what are the reasons for, for their behaviors, um, and whether there are other issues that, that need to be addressed. If yes. that is counterproductive and is actually harming the team, you need to take that in consideration as, as part of your decision. So yeah, I move the work of the individual, the team and the organization keeping that valuing people mindset mm -hmm. um i mean just um one thing you know so yes as, as, a, as a um yes a clear intervention or, or, or solution um yeah i mean if if there um if if uh uh if it is you know if you like a a, a simple issue of um personality differences um uh, or, or, or points like uh, um, issues like that um actually setting up some sort of system or, or process whereby this person can actually disseminate and share some of that specific <laughs> knowledge that they have um so that yes rather than it rather than it being yet yeah, th this person doesn't go to the pub on a friday after work therefore they, you know, they, they are excluded we want nothing to do with them um, yeah. Yeah. And i think it's it's very interesting in how we fill in the gaps so as human beings i was just looking through some of the comments and listening to some of the some of the conversations and there's so much narrative of what might be happening with this individual but the reluctance of us actually saying we need to have a conversation to understand mm. and distinguish what is counterproductive versus what is what is personality or what is unique to, to them that they bring into the team so i've seen a lot of comments of are they shy are they excluded are, are they this unique individual that has expertise therefore mm. they having superiority complex and, and all of these things and mm. I would bring that that thing back with depends, but that depends needs you need to ask questions. So always yes. ask questions. Um, and in, 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 if if it is of course an a, a, um, an attitudinal issue, and you know that that translates to behaviour. Ob obviously, if there are uh, are there are consequences to that in terms of performance, cohesion, and those points. Uh, yes, it, it potentially does become. Uh, you know, theoretically, a, a misconduct or performance type situation, but obviously, as part of that, you know, the, the discussion needs to be well. These are the potential consequences yeah. of yeah. The, you know those actions, that behaviour. Yeah. Uh, regard, and, regard and you still need to, to activate your valuing people, both for them as well as the rest of your team. Thank you very much, Mark, for sharing your thoughts. Oh, it was a pleasure. We're well, we'll almost end time. Yatinde, I can hear you on the background. I'm just looking at the chat now, um, um, and I've picked this one out. Is by Jackie, who said um, Jackie Clark, who said that the yeah. colleague may have actively excluded him as well, so he doesn't bother. Because the conversations we've we've been having now is about this this person. We haven't looked at it, you know, from the rest of the team. You know, why are they saying that? So it's really interesting what Jackie has said here that, you know, let's, let's look at it from another perspective that maybe the colleagues might have actually excluded him. So it just doesn't bother anymore. And yeah. when we have that conversation with the individual, it's something that, you know, may come out. He may actually say that himself or herself. But it's really, really, you know, different, a different view that Jackie has shared with us there. Thanks, Jackie. And that will come up in that conversation that you will have with the individual. So now we'll 
really, really, really close to, to the end of the session because uh, I'm trying not to keep you longer than, than seven here. I want you to either take post-its if you have post-its around or a notepad, whatever you have. I'm just gonna prompt you with some specific questions that I want you to, to use every other week within your practice. These will be questions just to make sure that you're staying true to this valuing people uh, behavior that we were talking about. So the first one is, whose views and opinions do you most readily consider in at work? Which voices may not be heard and how you can change that as a people professional? And I want you to ask that question as often as you can. So sometimes we give too much power to leaders and not enough to our staff. Sometimes we listen to people that look like us or think like us rather than people that are different. Just relating with that l and topic that we've just covered. How can you make sure that your value, your, your behavior of valuing people is at the strongest? The next one is, and you can write that down. I'll also make sure that you get the, the slides and the recording, but you can write that down if you want to do any reflections. But the next one is, how do you ensure your organization's decision-making process considers people's well-being? And we've covered this at, at the beginning a bit. So how do you look after your people and their well-being, specifically during this time? Now the third one is, when did you last review organization's approach to well-being? And has that been impacted by everything that is going on now? And the last one is, do you balance compassion and fairness in your approach? So if you have a team that you're working with, like your HR team or you're the head of an HR function, I would love for you to post these to your HR business partners, to your HR advisors to see what they say as well. If they are connected with, with these behaviors, are they leaving to, to those behaviors? And the last slide is basically just a summary of 100,000 different links of resources if you want to deep dive into this topic a bit more. So there's a CBD research report on best to good practice HR, developing the principles. This course, if you go on uh, the website, comes with a, a little bit of a workbook where you type in things and, and your reflections as you're proceeding through the course. Um, again, these are all contents developed and they are free for all members to, to uh, use. There's a CPD report on the road to good work. Uh, this is a discussion paper. Um, CPD in a nutshell, when purpose powers performance. A CPD survey on UK working lives and, and seeing some reflections on well being and, and connecting with uh, their values and behaviors in there. Uh, how you can create new solutions, worker force, and, and there's a blog. So you will be able to access that blog once I send you the links. In, and I'm just trying to type some things into the chat now. Um, alternative forms of workforce ploy voice and a positioning report that, that we've launched and gives you some insights into um, how you bring the employee voice into some of the decision making that you're making. And then the last one is health and well being, the responsibility and the role of media managers and how they can play as, as part of that. And I'm just adding in some, some more blogs. So these are some of the uh, resources that I'll be able to share with you. My links are working. I'll just include some of those that met, I mentioned in there in the follow-up email that you'll be getting from this event. And hope that you keep through to, to this specific behavior. Now we're 
literally the, this is the last slide that we have for, for tonight. It's a Q&A. And I don't know if we've addressed some as we go through it. Thank you very much for joining us. If you have any questions, you and I and myself are, are here to pick up any questions, concerns, feedback that you might have about the session. Well, thank you, Tanya. Yeah. And it's really great to see the network going on in the chat and you know the connections that people are forming, which is really great. Connect on Twitter, LinkedIn. That's really great. Keep the conversation going. Perfect. So thank you very much for joining us. If you have more questions and uh, you don't want to address them now, you will have my contact details and you can also connect with me over LinkedIn. Um, actually, let me just take it to my LinkedIn and maybe stop my screen share. So you can find me as Ciprian Arhira on LinkedIn. My email address is address is now in the chat box. This is my LinkedIn profile. Lovely meeting you all. Okay. And I'll see you at the next one. Thank you all.